Does anyone here know what a toroidal dipole is? Anyone? Hands up. I won't bite. Okay. Does anyone know what an anapole is? Anapole. An anapole. An apple. I know what an apple is. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So um, an anapole was something proposed by Zeldovich in 1957. It's critical to what I'm going to be talking about today. And the toroidal dipole was derived in a thesis in 1965 uh, by a, a researcher at the Dubna Nuclear Physics uh, Research Center in Russia. The name of the guy was called Dubovik. And you'll see that I got to that through a very circuitous route. But essentially, it kind of completes electrodynamics. And it wasn't recognized in the West until 1997. I think at Caltech, they found the toroidal moment in two uh, element isotopes. And it is barely recognized by the physics community worldwide, even today. I hope, maybe, if I can get this working, <laughs> Um, that uh, you will see that maybe this is an extremely important thing to consider. You may not think that, or something else. So if you haven't seen the ultra experiment, it came about by uh, accident completely. What happened was, we had some indium that I selected for the purpose of testing whether there were some weak interactions in the vibration system of one Dr. Ruishin Amaza in Tokyo. And indium I chose for a number of reasons. I've spoken about some of them during the week. Uh, one is it is a, a, a neutron absorber. Uh, it's about the same as gold. Uh, two, it, it, it has almost entirely a beta isotope. And if we're going to look for weak, weak interactions that are very effective, we want a long-lived beta isotope to see anything occurring. Uh, it had a low melting point, that was very critical because we we're going to be applying a Marza gas later on. And um, it was very soft, so I thought if there was any cavitation in the cavitation system, that when the, the bubbles came out and hit the indium, it would leave very good impressions on there. And in fact, much of what we would have wanted to come out of that, uh, came out of it. And, but that's already been shared. So thank you very much to the ICMNS working group for allowing me to present here today. This is ULTRA, a simple, quick and repeatable demonstration of the Lena process, in my opinion. Uh, and I have this question is, how can this happen? Okay, so um, the question is, how does that jump so high? And I think they did some research on this in the US and they found that they couldn't actually explain with standard hydrodynamics how you got these things jumping way, way, way out of the water. Okay, uh, so this is my plan. Speak as fast as I need to, uh, to get through the slides. Completely ignore interruptions and take questions at the coffee break, which was in the past, so I'm not even gonna take the questions. <laughs> Right, so what is the toroidal moment? Did anyone find out? In, no, okay, all right. Um, so uh, the hypothesis I aim to describe is that self-organized sound-initiated resonant yin-yang structures leads to fractal toroidal moments and vortical matter flow, which captures dark matter, focusing it to a point through which the other matter flows, and this leads to weak interactions, fusion, fission, transmutation, and coherent matter phenomena, including matter collapse and rebirth, collectively matter transformation. Okay, so this was the indium foil that was exposed for about, what was it, George? I think about 10 minutes. Yeah, it, in the Amaza vibrator. There were several features on this, but this is quite striking because of the arrangement. This is the morphology, uh, the fact that you've got glassy carbon and, and a whole range of elements. I won't go into it, but hold that image in your mind, and if you can, flip it in your head. Um, so this is exposed to the Amaza vibrator. 
Here are the elements on there, but we're not going to focus on that. Um, but what happened was, we had some control indium, and Alan uh, took the initiative to clean it before we examined it under his SEM in California. <laughs> And he gave it to me, and I think, oh, you cleaned it? Oh, okay, all right. So I put it on the SEM, and this is what I found, these huge craters. Literally, I turned on the SEM, and that's the first image that came up. And I thought, well, this is interesting. Should we have a look at those craters? And uh, I just, I've got a line scan here. I won't dwell on it, but essentially, you've got the carbon coming up, and then you've got the... Uh, well, I don't know what the colors are on here. Silicon coming up, and then the oxygen, and obviously carbon and oxygen fused is silicon. No, I can't. Um, so this is the experiment, ultra. And you, now I've got 25 minutes. I need to speak, otherwise I'll stop before I get to the end. Please, no interruptions. <laughs> you can watch it on YouTube later at half speed, as many times as you don't like. Right, so <laughs> ultra experiment here. Um, these are the components you need. Uh, you need to be at least, I would suggest, five years old to get the maximum out of it. And it takes about uh, three or four minutes of instruction. And I will skip this. You can look at that video in your own time another time. Okay, so the first person to replicate, having presented this possibility, first at Madison, Wisconsin University, and then three days later here in my poster session at ICCF 22 in 2019, was Alan Cusk. And what I said was, don't use indium, use some other metal foil. And I didn't want to do anything, I just wanted someone to try it somewhere. And five, six months later, this guy tried his kitchen foil in his house, and he saw these striking features, these not regularly arrayed um, pits and troughs. This was the capability of his microscope. And also these tracks. I said, well, I thought that's interesting. And so I did a lot of uh, experimentation with various high-speed cameras and so forth, found that in extremely num short numbers of cycles, just like you saw with that Tibetan singing bowl, you get these yin-yang structures forming. And uh, the key thing is here, is down the bottom, you see when I turn off the sound, in, you've got like, th this is the black hole, and this is the, the white bit on a yin-yang, and it's exactly that proportion. You get a toroidal bubble, and then it just lifts off because it's, it's you know, lighter than the water. <laughs> okay, so th that is kind of spinning around. There's lots and lots and lots of videos of the toroidal things spinning around and all the action you might expect in there. Um, but David Boutlier, after I shared a huge number of uh, experiments in Canada, he replicated this, and he just decided after running it for a little time to put a magnet in there and see if, what would happen. Well, he started to see all these flecks picking up on the magnet. Now, this is interesting because it was only the peaks and troughs. It was only, well, you don't know because if it's upside down, it's the same thing, but anyway. It was only the peaks, so he put that under the microscope, saw a little hole in it like you saw in Alan Cusk's work. So I thought, well, uh, I think I know what that is, because if the aluminium's become magnetic enough to be picked up by that, maybe it's these magnetic charges that, uh, that were observed in cavitation systems with, with people in Russia, and it's, it's focusing on that central point. And if that's the case, I then spoke to Alan. I said, you've got the trans uh, ultrasonic system. You have an SEM. Please go and get an eight, whatever it was, thickness, the thickest aluminium foil you can get, and he got 85 micron or something from his local hardware store. Put it on there, he ran it for 18 minutes, and he put the magnet around, and uh, before we go there, shoulders Matsumoto uh, say that uh, exotic vacuum objects with the same family uh, of ball lightning, as ball lightning, they could transmute elements with ease and take the form of torrids and spheres. Matsumoto said from 1993 that his itonic clusters were equivalent to microball lightning and could transmute matter as well as uh, lead to the complete decay of and regeneration of matter into common elements such as carbon, oxygen, and iron. They could take the form of torrids and spheres. We replicated nearly every one of those observations by those two parties. Before I was aware of the second party, I was aware of the first one before many of the replications. So um, here's some natural phenomena. The one on the right is a ball lightning impact in Hestalen in Norway, and that is an iron-rich crenellated sphere they recovered from the impact site. On the right, you've got supposedly 2.7 billion year old micrometeorites. Look at them, digest that. I don't believe that right thing anyway, but this is in Me356's tungsten rod electric discharge in potassium carbonate, like water, 
uh, in an alumina chamber. He produced that in 2016. And whilst it's much, much bigger, you can see the scale, that's 10 microns over there. This is 200 microns. This is in George Eagley's dusty fusion reactor. And again, it's a crenellated microsphere, okay? This is what happened. I said to Alan, I said, please do this experiment, and I predict exactly. You will see iron-rich crenellated microspheres. That is an extremely precise prediction. So he went away after three days, because he had to get his things together, he had was doing some other things, and he came back and he produced many of them using that uh, uh, 85 micron foil and 18 minutes of ex exposure to the same device that I was showing out there yesterday. And what you see is carbon and oxygen, and then you see these, these usual suspects here. And on the outside, you get silicon and, and iron oxides. And it's actually encased in this encrustation that follows around the outside. Also, you'll notice that these sections are sometimes triangular, and it has this completely glassy, well, this is a broken one, they're hollow. They're hollow. And it has a crenellation there, okay? Now, hollow uh, uh, things are what was observed by Solin in his uh, quantum uh, nuclear synthesis generator in 1992. It's also what is observed by Klimov. He observes all of these hollow structures. We've synthesized them in copper in the crystal grain boundaries, grain boundaries, and can watch them grow, and, and so on. And it spews out carbon, mostly. And that's the front cover of Matsumoto's book. The nuclear reactions, according to Solin and Matsumoto, occur inside the spheres, or the, the complete decay of matter. So this is Bin Zhuen Huang at uh, New Energy Center uh, uh, in Taipei. He chose copper. And it's almost like you cannot fail. In fact, I don't know anyone that's tried this experiment and failed. So if you want to be the first, I'll be glad to hear it. <laughs> okay? Now the thing is, it produces this circular section in the center, and the two arms and a bar galaxy. And in free water, you see exactly the structure of the phantom galaxy from the James Webb Telescope. Exactly. Um, here, what you typically get, what we found, I'm not going to go through all the data, you'll be pleased to know, is sometimes lighter elements and heavier elements, on, depending on whether you're on the yin and the yang. Okay. Oh, you don't want to watch that. <laughs> Okay, so this is another researcher. It's um, a different frequency, 25 kilohertz. Ours is 43 kilohertz, the ones that we've been doing. Um, but uh, I believe what we're seeing is that is the center of that and that. And from a 90 degree uh, perpendicular, you get a vortex coming out there and a vortex coming out there. Okay, and this is one like yin yang pair. Okay, uh, the structure on the right, if you rotate that, flip it, and, and don't do any scaling or distortion, it fits exactly the center of the, uh, uh, the galaxy. And this is like Bostick said, these structures are the same as below, above, so below. So this system here is a piezo transducer, uh, ultrasonic horn, a flat hard plate. Uh, it's in air, and there's an organic compound in there. I won't go into it, it'll be in the paper. And it, it organizes on the node, but note, there is a separation to two spots around the node. That is what's happening in the reactor. So we're looking at a, a standing wave vertically. So when we do the experiment, we have a plastic plate, the aluminum foil, and it's so self-organizing. The foil moves into the node, so you cannot fail. I mean, you literally have to desperately not want to, this to work. Okay, so, shoulders again on how EVOs may work. When seeking a physical an analogy for the driving force behind this process, which always occurs uh, to produce a blacker EVO state, in the absence of disturbance, a pressure analogy can be evoked. A driving force is seen to occur between the higher pressure side of our white universe, that's where you and I live, and the other black universe residing in an effectively lower pressure region of space. It might even be appropriate to sig signify that the black universe identified here is the much touted dark matter regime, which is said to dominate in quantity over our normal matter. I only read that quote because it's in a book two days ago. But the presentation was basically done on that basis. But this is shoulders. I didn't know he'd said that. So this is my uber crummy sketch. <laughs> basically, when you, when you'll see it, you have a toroidal moment here. 
a, a soliton will move this way, and the soliton moves that way. It creates what looks like a first and third harmonic combination shape. Um, and the toroidal moment goes out here, and it maximally produces a cone of the golden ratio. And we've got this on many, many, many different experiments in different systems. The dark matter comes in here because they are toroidal. They can be interacted with the toroidal moment, not by electromagnetism. It comes in here, but if you notice this is going around here, the flux of water or the contaminations or the things you want to transmute come through the other way, and they meet in this central point. So, cavitation heat generator. I'm just going to do a little bit of history here. Cavitation was done in 1980 by Kladov, right? Two to seven times in his cavitation system, excess heat. Uh, the response of the Russian community was ridicule. Uh, cavitation destruction of matter from his 1997 to 2002 work. Uh, he uh, established that there appeared to be changing of structure of nucleide, adding one or more structural elements, changing of structure of nucleide, dividing into several fragments, and changing the structure of the nucleide, to dividing into the smallest structural fragments by a complete transformation of the matter uh, into radiation, field forms of ma matter, talking complete collapse of the matter. So this is the uh, apparatus. I don't want to go in this, but he remediated cesium-137. Uh, 20 hour treatment reduction, 65.1%. So, uh, the cavitation destruction of matter, uh, that you can go and look at the tables in your own time, but basically 19 elements after two hours, 23 elements after eight hours, 29 elements, and so on. So it splits things and then it re reorganizes it. The yin yang is the great leveler in this system. And by the way, it happens in, it was in Park and Bond's reactor, it's in HHO, the same things. So the Russian uh, response was more ridicule. And then I'll talk about this vortex tube, the rank hilson vortex tube. Uh, you can, this is just from Wikipedia. Basically, the vortex goes in and out the other way, and the dynamics of it has a soliton there, okay? And you get hot gas coming out one way and really cold gas coming out the other. So uh, the vortex heat generators, the first person in Russia to try doing this vortex heat generator, not in a gas which is compressible, but in, in water, which is not basically much compressible, um, was Alexander Merkelov, and he found actually they did get excess heat and it was more than 100%. They thought, that's crazy. So despite no one knowing how these really work, these water versions, uh, devices using the principle called vortex heat generators are produced by around 20 organizations. There's many patents of uh, different variations in Russia, Ukraine, Lithuania, and, and Moldova. So uh, these people have these different theories in Russia about how these work because they've been using them for so long. Energy is taken from hydrogen and oxygen atoms. That's quite possible with what I'll say later. Uh, Anna announced the discovery of polarization waves. I don't even know what that is. Uh, energy is taken away from the gravitational field. I can buy that. Uh, torsional fields resulting in the energy taken from the vacuum. I can buy that. You can't buy that because you don't know about toroidal moments. But I can buy it. So others rely on the cavitation when bubbles are formed, when water twists. So this is one of the devices that they have. So to get around the cavitation destruction of the matter, they force pulses in here, which produces expansion cycles, 500,000 a second, in these for domestic home heaters has a COP of about 1.5 typically. Um, and the cavitation occurs in the center of the channel. So it doesn't contact the surface and, and the explosions or the implosions go on over here. So it can work for a very long period of time without damaging anything. And the interesting thing is it's rare refraction pulses. And rare refraction pulses will lead to solitons. Solitons are your yin yangs. They do the work. It's not necessarily cavitation. A method, a method for this, that's the pattern. 1.5. So the hydrowave technology is an extension of this, which was used to, develop, uh, to destroy chemical weapons in the Soviet Union. Okay? They needed another use for it. They were running out of nasty stuff, right? <laughs> so it, this is the device, and it was Afsanaev and, and Promtov. Uh, there's the device. These are the actual devices that were used for destroying uh, biological weapons um, uh, and chemical weapons and so on. So. Um, basically, you've got the reference down there. What they're saying is they managed to reduce the amount of strontium-90, and they say credited this to weak interactions caused by the hydrowave action in the solution. And uh, this was confirmed by US experts in the field of technology. And it was recorded. There was an uh, unclassified uh, um, distribution that you can download here, and I think many of you have actually read that and not, probably not clocked this work. They've just got like half a sentence uh, credited to it, but there was a lot more that went on. 
So, response in the Russian community 15 years on was, uh, uh, perhaps Kladov was right. So, Amar's a vibrator. He applied for a patent July 27, 2007. He ap applied this around about 100 hertz vibration to water for 100 hours, and he had all the usual suspect elements synthesized in the water. And those are the zero before and afterwards. Same thing, different researcher who had no clue that this had already been done in Russia. Uh, this is his device. It vibrates like that, that's 10 times slowed down. Metal plates, plenty of opportunity to get standing waves between these things and see exactly what you saw in that in-air system and exactly what you saw and you can do for $35 with a one cent uh, um, uh, consumable with your children. So this is one of the plates. He said, I don't think there's gravitation going on. I said, just let me have a look at one of the plates. And one of his cut staff came up after two hours and had a look at it under the light. And I said, look at all those cavitation spots. <laughs> and they look like this. You've got your yin yangs. And it also, you've got toroids moving around carrying other ions. Mm, isn't that interesting? So uh, I took one plate home. Well, <laughs> George was uh, putting the tea on. And I cranked up my microscope, which I'd got with a polarizing filter. I'd chosen that because I imagined that if this is coherent matter and it goes through the, the material, it will change the magnetic and the optical properties of the material. It was hilarious. I went like that, go, I can't see anything, can't see anything, got the polarizer, bang. There's a, there's a, a spiral vortex track, like a strange radiation track, coming out of the center of a cavitation spot. So uh, I looked at his, uh, there's a vortex pair, uh, it produces diamond, double diamond in the form of magnesium in the vortex, and, and chromium, which is quad diamond. Okay, and this is in one of the other experiments that we went to remember there. Okay, um, he looked at the Fukushima water in 2012, and they remediated 137 cesium and 134 cesium, and after, um, you can see the barium there, so it's a weak interaction. That's what they observed, uh, the change from 0.52 milligrams per liter to three milligrams per liter. And after 30 days, it's done about two half lives, I think, on the, on the right hand there. So it worked. Uh, there's Leclerc, he produced all the elements in the periodic table, same system. So um, I was looking at something that inspired uh, Ken Shoulders to do his work that much of the Russian research is, research is based on. This is a sample, I have it in my box, you can have a look at it. But I found four quantization levels of what Solin calls, which I didn't know at the time because I hadn't read his paper, but um, his patent. But um, these, pat these uh, yin yang structures, and they're like uh, phallico solitons, they're just sometimes they're together and sometimes they're apart. And I've got them uh, very small, 4D times with the rotation. The same structure rotated around here, and you can see the center bit coming through on the aluminium there, and this is viewing from the top. And then that goes on this structure, and it's got 48 segments around the outside. This structure is not spinning. It's spinning the spin aluminium nuclei around itself and the electrons, which are also spin. Okay, you don't want to see that. So this is the structure I published on 17th of February 2020, and this is what I want to know from uh, our string theory guy, if this is what he meant by 6D torus because you've got the 2D and the 2D and the 2D, right? And I thought that this was the structure of the physical vacuum, and um, uh, I later found out that it's the only possible structure of the physical vacuum from Russian research. But basically, it's a self-similar, and if you can imagine one of these subsegments to be a, a copy of the whole thing. And you don't want to see that either. Okay, so this explains Bostick's D4D structures that he published with Nardi in 1980. So he actually specifically says D4D down here, and he saw the impact marks, and they're spoked. Of course, he was craking toroids, putting them over a magnetic field, uh, and they were joining together into a toroid of toroids. It was only a two-tor. What I showed was a three-tor, but it was a fractal tor, and I was only doing the third degree, because it doesn't really matter after that. Um, of course, John Archibald Wheeler, kind of predicted this. Look at what he says in his 1954 paper. Regions of strong electric field strength, here, in a simple toroidal gion of zero angular momentum, it's not spinning. <laughs> uh, two waves of uh, extreme strength, uh, of equal strength, run round the torus in upper, opposite directions to produce a standing wave, with electric fields strong in the regions indicated and magnetic fields in between. The gravitational field, by this disturbance at the end, 
are required to hold the disturbance together. I can't say it was right, it was 1954, but I think it's pretty similar. So, we've seen these structures in abundance in different experiments. Here's one, a model of it, we see it there so many times it's a boring, frankly. Here's another one, but this was a solid structure. So the structures are neutral, they're vacuum currents. This has been calculated by the Russians in the 1980s and, and by the American Department of Energy in 2009. So they're, they're vacuum currents and um, they can take electrons and ions and wrap them around themselves. And so you sometimes get these. They tend to all be calcium, these structures. There's another one, different level of fractal tor. There's a broken one and another broken one and you can see it's a torus of tori, which would then be a tori. It's exactly what I predicted from Hutchison's sample. Here's the first one that I found here by accident. I saw it in the train around home. I sent that to the Russians and that started an amazing cascade of events. They threw in the towel. <laughs> and it ended up with this, which is, a, which is an analog of the energetics research that they did. Um, and this is a, a four-tor and according to uh, um, uh, Nevesky in his 1993 paper peer-reviewed in the Electricity Russian Journal, this produces a vacuum current. It can capture zero-point energy or any photons uh, and a lot of other funky stuff, according to Freiberger, who says it can cause matter to fall apart. This is, oh, someone's suddenly made a coherent matter thing. It was so exciting back in 2020, 2021. We'd only been showing these things for, for years. But anyway, there we go. Right, so the other key structure is these triangles. So this is not a break point. Iron behaves differently because it's ferromagnetic and these are magnetic charges. So they build up to a point where the metal breaks. I have this sample, you can look at it. And it, there's, there's nothing in the world that can stop the magnetic repulsion, it just twists. This is in aluminium, so you get a softer effect. This is in silicon dioxide, so you get a hard effect. And if you can imagine looking down the end of this, down the end of this, and down the end of that, which is in my view, maximally, a uh, golden ratio triangle, you see a spiral. This is in Matsumoto's work in palladium deuterium, and he mo uh, observed multiple of these triangles. Didn't quite know what they were, but this is gravity waves. <laughs> he says they're gravity waves, and that's focusing the gravity waves. So Shishkin was asked to make a uh, water oil mixing device. This is it. He turned it on, and he felt extremely ill next to it. So he decided to put some x-rays on and he found these things called birdies, right? Some of them call them mushrooms in, in Russia. But we've seen these in 3D in different experiments. But this is where this thing that can interact with the spin of the electron rips the electrons off the silver that's in the x-ray film and moves it around exposing it. But it also releases five to 10 keV uh, uh, electrons as well as these things disassemble and any ions that have been carried with it form pits. Um, and this is the key point here. Stream vortex solitons. These are the EVOs that Alexander Parkhamov is lensing into a beta uh, sample. Okay? They are natural ones. They are utterly ubiquitous. They are coherent condensate through the entire universe. Now, how do you make them? How do you make them? Well, <clears throat> I'll tell you how you make them. Anything that you know works in Lena. Anything. The shocks, the pulses, the, the, the charges, the pressure waves, the solitons, whatever. But they have identified that these structures, these electromagnetic phantoms, which come, when you, when you take an atom, that you can knock out the core, you end up with the electrons going off, so you get a lot of free electrons, and then you have a neutrino cluster, which was basically Kept, kept the atom alive. It gets the neutrino flux from the universe and it spins it out. And it's a balance caused by the relationship between the electrons and the nucleus. And so you get this thing that comes out and that can go back when the electrons join with the, uh, with the uh, proton or whatever it is, they can go back and they get their own uh, neutrinos back. So you gain that mass, you gain that energy, okay? And here's the kicker. It's 2,000 to 4,000 times easier to produce these things with hydrogen isotopes. So the best thing you can possibly do is that. This is the magnetic moment, so just to show it, you have a magnetic moment uh, from an electric current. Here's what you've got with Bostic, which is the toroidal moment. This is a toroidal M2, and this is a, a something like I've got there. This is an anapole. The description of an anapole in 2016 is identical to the 1986 conclusion 
of uh, Ken Shoulders. You read those two, no time now. These are, this is a, um, a depending on the moment of the subtors, in the uh, subtoroidal structure, um, toroidal moment, you can get a, um, a spindle torus. This is in a, a Vega experiment of ours. And this is the inside part of the spindle torus of another thing that blew up. And notice it's a crenellated, iron-rich spindle torus. So if you can imagine the torus over intersects and you have the outside now on the inside. <laughs> so you create what's called a lemon. So that's the apple whirling silently in space. Uh, that's the anapole, where it came from. So this is a paper from 2014, and they are actually exploring what they call hypertoroids. This is the official name in the West for them, for the people that are interested. And, and, and basically, depending on the, the level of your subtorus spin, you can end up producing tori, spindle tori, and that's up to a, an aspect ratio of 0.9. I imagine if you get to an aspect ratio of one, like you do in ultra, in a few cycles, you get a sphere, which is hollow. And if you put an electric field across them, you have a, a, a bi-state, which is switchable, and they're looking at this in very little devices for your next generation computers. This is a real thing. It's out there, people are doing it for your next generation memory. Spin one way with the electric field, spin well, then it's a stable state. So, spin nuclei, aluminium, copper, silver, indium, and, and, and gold, they are moved or captured by the toroidal moment. We have experiments where we see no melting of the brass, but where these two counter-rotating forces are, it's shifted the brass through the metal plate, out through the other side, and there's no pressure there. It's absolutely breathtaking. Magnetic iron and FeO2 stay in the magnetic core. That's what stays in the magnetic core. Non-spin synthesized elements uh, in the nuclei get ejected, and they tend up going around the torus that's making the core. And that's why you get these calcium and, uh, and tori. Uh, these are the elements I would suggest which are good for fuel. Notice, I couldn't have got a better job with my indium. It's like the best one on the table, by accident. Um, and uh, these are your ratios uh, uh, for your which you typically see in Lena Rash, and you can see that the most, most of these things that you see in Lena Rash are actually uh, non-spin nuclei. Back at this image, we're wrapping up now. This is on a zinc oxide plate. This is a ball lightning that blew up in our, one of our uh, Henk Uren's Vega experiments. I managed to spot it. What do you have? At the core, you have your iron-rich crenellated sphere. Around that, you have silicon dioxide there and there, and you have calcium oxide further out. And you get a feel of magnesium and carbon and all of the usual suspects like sodium and everything. And guess what? The principal elements that the EDS picked up at that distance from the sample were exactly the spectrum of the only spectrum of ball lightning ever published in physical review. And it's only recent by Chinese. They were trying to capture the spectrum of lightning. They caught the spectra of ball lightning. It, it saw calcium, silicon, and iron. And this is exactly what we produce with a thing that we found in the impact site of ball lightning in 2003 with Italian researchers. And we come through to this point. So there we go. Thank you to Francesco Cellani uh, for having the courage to let us verify his technology. And uh, to Ryan Hunt for doing the work. All of the many experimenters that have allowed us to look at their and test their claims without any restrictions. And thanks to Dave Henhenk, especially with the re recent work over the last several years. Alan Goldwater, big shout out to Alan. Thank you, man. I love you. Um, all of the highly active followers out, uh, uh, of the output of the project and all of the very many donors to the project, which without, uh, we would not be able to function. So thank you very much. Indeed, uh, it was hard to follow you because you speak fast, but mainly there is a lot and a lot and a lot of information. And it's impressive to see how much work is done in the Russia because you read the Russia and things like that. I, I took a small slice. Yeah, okay. But if we want to follow you, you if we want to start to follow all that things uh, slowly, where would you suggest us to start? What kind of experiment, in a few words, as a first experiment, would you suggest 
to have something convincing to it's worth to try to follow you. So I would choose Matsumoto's uh, experiment that he did in 1996 that he shared with this ICCF, most of the people in this ICF group. Um, and he used a one millimeter lead wire, pure lead wire, in a folded pure copper box in a Petri dish with um, some uh, potassium hydroxide, so no carbon, in light water. He then used 120 volts because I think in... It, 120, well it's in here extremely well described. But, so 120 volts, a few pulses, and then he found a hollow sphere of lead ejecting carbon. And we replicated this in at least two systems before we even knew of his work. Uh, oh, I haven't got it here, bad luck. <laughs> I, I have a, a, a one in, in the Vega experiments with an incredible crenellated sphere and out of it you're seeing silicon, carbon, all of the things that all of these people have said they saw and that's the basis of their audited patterns. Uh, you represented plenty of different uh, phenomena, very interesting, uh, a lot of speculation. Uh, I, I, I mean, we live from speculation in physics, there's no problem, but finally we need some numbers. Well, it's great because all of the numbers are in the peer reviewed papers that I shared. Yeah. 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 Lovely. If you have so many phenomena, you should have a, a kind of order. And the order I would see here is that the collective uh, um, uh, stays, collective interactions. So there are two, uh, two problems. In the cold fusion, the problem is to come from the atomic scale of electron volts to mega electron volts. And in this uh, situation, you need uh, 10 to 6, 10 to 7. Uh, particles or even more. No, because, because it's weak interaction. No. Okay. <laughs> so this is something what you can uh, do, of course, but it's uh, speculation which, and you should show us how it works. Okay, there's one point. Another point, if you are speaking about gravitation and some uh, uh, so-called uh, magnetic monopole story, uh, structures of electrons is well, well known, there's no problem. But uh, what is the problem? That you have not anymore the cold fusion, you have a hot fusion, or, or maybe. Is there any question? Because can I step in and answer things that you're asking? I thought, question, yeah, oh, okay. So no, if, no, if it was not a monopole, why would it be a sphere? This uh, uh, magnetic, so called, it's not really cosmic. Magnetic monopole. <laughs> this structure, the third structure, was uh, published in Nature in the 19th. Uh, so there's no problem that people study it. The problem is, however, uh, you should dis distinguish between hot and cold fusion. Because uh, in uh, uh, some uh, experiments. You can so in my presentation, I. Okay. There's no problem, high temperature of, of even one million degrees, the cavitation expense of glass animals. Can, can, I, can I address the cold part? Okay. This is conducted in water, one. Two, uh, so the same. So hold on, hold on. Presented so different phenomena which have not, nothing to do with each other. You know. Yes, they have everything, they're exactly the same effect. This one point, this in, in, point is something okay. different. If you are speaking about red events, yeah, which is really rare and very difficult to construct, this is not help for confusion. Confusion should be working continuously and shouldn't be independent on, on some... You are $35 and 7 minutes away from finding out it works. Okay. Okay, uh, so... Round like a circle in a spiral, like a wheel within a wheel, never ending or beginning on a never spinning wheel.